Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. Today, my guest is Alan Hartman. He's a Toltec master, an expert at relationships. Thank you, Alan, for being my guest today. And how are you today? Delightful to see you, Victoria. I'm Thank good. You. I'm good. You are wonderful. Yeah, Great. Yeah. So let's go to the very beginning. You were working with Don Miguel Luis and the author of Mastery of Love and the Four Agreements. You were a student of his for many years. And you learned a lot from him. And it must have been an incredible journey that you took with him. Would you please share that with us? Yeah, I'd love to. The, it was quite a journey. And it's funny because when I met him, I kind of thought I knew a lot of what he was already teaching because I had already been doing hypnotherapy and training new hypnotherapists and had a practice and all. And so I, I was pretty smart. You know, I already knew a lot of stuff up here. And when I met him, <clears throat> I was more, I was more focused on making sure he knew that I knew that he was talking about stuff that I already knew, but he was saying it well, that I was actually listening and, and absorbing who he was and what he was. And I was with him for 10 years, and, and in those first few years, I was so busy with all my strategies that I learned about how to get approval and how to get recognition, and I was hoping he'd wink at me and let me know that he knew that I knew that you know it wasn't like the rest of the people in the room. And it took me a while before I realized that, and he actually told me one day, he said, I'm just making up all these stories, all these mythologies, all these things I keep coming up with to keep you guys coming back until you can really see and understand what it is I'm doing. He said, what I'm really doing here is just loving you. And I, it still took me a while after that to understand that he, what he meant was he was seeing right through all of my needs to approval and all my strategies to get acceptance and loving me, accepting me, love as acceptance. He was accepting me for the person I was, the whole package, and especially seeing past all that to the, the divinity, to the, that part of me that was exactly like him, that spiritual presence, and he was just relating to that. Well, I was like, oh, you know, good point and all this kind of thing. The steady flow, the outcome of happiness, of love, of, of acceptance coming at me. So it took me a while to get that. When I did, well, then I was nervous that he could see, if he was seeing past my strategies, he was going to see what the judge inside was always telling me, that I wasn't good enough the way I was. I needed to improve and get right answers and take notes and study and have, you know, have the right answer for him before he could accept me. And so it was worrisome to realize that he was looking right through all of my masks and stuff, and he was seeing me. Scared me. But after I really got that what he was doing was approving, you know, he was accepting that because he recognized what it was, was the divine that animates me. Uh, from then on, I was, it was just a kind of a bliss relationship, just falling into love together. And along the way, we did great workshops. We went to, to every pyramid you know about, like all through the Yucatan and Chichen Itza and Teotihuacan, which is the pyramid complex north of Mexico City that's the home of the Toltecs, and Egypt. I mean, we were everywhere. But really, it was just so we could go around and have these experiences and try to blast us out of these places where we were hiding. But when I stopped and really felt into it, it was, oh, this is what love is. This is what acceptance is. If I can have that for myself, I don't have to hide anymore. And if I don't have to hide anymore, I don't have to pretend to be something I'm not anymore. I can say, this is what I am. And that acceptance of myself is what has brought me a great deal of happiness and joy. And from that happiness place and that acceptance of me has allowed me to be like him in that I can accept everything out there. I can see the perfection of the universe. And I am so grateful to him because he gave me that gift, a gift of life that 
I'd been struggling so hard to find and with all the different things I had done over the years and the books I'd read and the workshops I'd taken. But what, what was missing from all those things was that one very essential thing, which was the love and acceptance that I thought I had to earn and get it right for. And it turned out it could be received, freely given and received. So it was being freely given, but I didn't know how to freely receive it until I started doing it for myself, using that to do it for myself. Because we can't really receive that, like I can't receive pure love and acceptance if I'm down here beating myself up and saying I'm not good enough. I can't really receive it. I would be happy to receive somebody saying I'm not good enough. But it's hard to receive what I don't understand inside of me. So now my work is really that. I get people together, I do workshops, I do conscious relationship circles, I take people to pyramids, and the trick is I want to love them. And that's my job. So quite simply, what you're saying is that he was asking you and others to drop out of your mind, your ego, your, your thoughts, and drop more into your heart, into your purity of who you are. Yeah. And in there, everything is in its com complete, correct, ease and flow order. What was this man like? when you first met him. I mean, he has an amazing story. He learned this from his uh, grandmother, mm -hmm. the Totec mastery of an ancient civilization in Mexico mm -hmm. that was very highly spiritually advanced. He was a heart surgeon. What more do you know of him on a personal level of, of who he is and mm -hmm. how he had these answers that he understood so well and nobody else has was understanding this as clear as he was understanding it. Yeah. You know, he was like the 13th child in a big family, and his, his grandfather trained his mother, and then his mother was a curandera. She was a healer, and just amazing woman, about five feet tall, barely, and little, and but she would just pray over people and do egg cleansings where they take a raw egg and move them over people's bodies and, and pull out things. And then she would drop the egg into a glass of water and study it. And the filaments would come and the yolk would do different things. And she had interpretations for all of it. It was fascinating to watch. I've done some of that myself, but I don't have the depth of that kind of training from her that would be sweet to have. But there was a point where he said, you know, let's, we want to train. So what she did was she got 21 people together for I think three and a half years, every Sunday, and these people committed themselves to being there and meeting, and she took them into what she called the dream time, inside, exploring their own inner world, their own dreaming mind, and how they distort the perfection of the universe, and into other people's experiences, and learning how to take the consciousness out and dream into other people. And when I met him, he was, I think he said he was one of the only, if not the only person that actually went all that way to that experience in that group of 20 people doing it that long. But when I met him, he was still teaching like old stuff from old traditions, the luminous egg and drawing charts of etheric doubles and that kind of thing. And I was fascinated, you know, because I'd read Carlos Castaneda and some of the other mystical writers about Toltec. And here I had my own Nagual, you know, I had my own mystical guy. So I was drawing pictures and taking notes. And I've got a file still like this thick with, with notes that I took on yellow pads from being with him. And Had he had written the books yet, Mastery of Love and the Four Agreements? No, when I met him, he hadn't written anything. Ah. Nobody much knew him. There was just a small group of people that were meeting with him personally, which is very special. Yes. And uh, so, but early on, he kind of got it that he really wanted to teach us to love. And that all this knowledge wasn't really teaching us to love. It was just teaching us how to get more hooked on our minds, how hooked in performance, more hooked in performance, how to perform for him back, and what to tell other people about what my Nagual, Nagual told me. But it wasn't the real deal. So very early on, within the first year of when I started being with him, he dropped a lot of that stuff and just started talking about very simple ways that we could quit believing our minds, quit getting hooked by our minds, quit being afraid of the inner judge and, 
and, and open, like you said, more to our heart place. And about, I don't know, three years into that, two years into that, he started talking about these four agreement things. On and on and on and on. And we thought, what's going on? And, but what he was doing was making recordings of it and then, and then using that to, to you know, morph and mold into this book. And the four agreements are to basically undo all of the, the entanglements that we would have in our, in our dreams, in our mind that gets lost in its own dream. Mm -hmm. And the four agreements are don't take anything personal, always do your best. Uh, be impeccable with your word and don't assume anything. Mm -hmm. And these four agreements, if you just take any one of these four agreements, you will, get, you will know complete freedom. Yes. Complete freedom from, and freedom from what, basically? Freedom from our, our negativities, freedom, freedom from our attachments, freedom from our fears. We will have an open energy that is just pure in its natural state. Yeah. Why is it that humans are getting into this uh, state of, of lost in their own dreams and not able to express themselves from their own natural purity? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that we have a whole history of, of religions and, and knowledge and, and cultural repression and division, separation that hopefully is changing now. You know, there's more and more people reaching out, things like this show you do, which is so great, and, and people watching it, and people caring about it, and people interested. And, and The Four Agreements has sold, I don't know how many million copies. Last I checked, it had been translated into 32 different languages. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's an important book. It was published in 1997, I believe. So here we are 14 years later, and this book is still in on airport bookstore counters and racks and top tens and I mean it's this is a book that people have come to a lot and it's partly because he was able to get his his love into it when I read it I hear his voice I hear his energy I feel him and I think even people that don't know him are having that same experience with it so it's a very powerful book different than all he's written some other wonderful books but that one is different in that way hmm. But it's also a time when people are wanting to wake up. My theory, if you want to have a theory, is that consciousness is evolving. Consciousness is evolving from separation to unity. The Big Bang, duality, took everything and separated it. And consciousness broke itself up into all the parts that it animates in creation. But I believe that the goal of consciousness through that process was to come back together and knowing itself as one thing. And it, the trees and the squirrels and all that, they already know. They don't need books or workshops. So humans are the ones that forgot. We went to sleep. Consciousness went to sleep inside of us and forgot who it was, what it was. And so we go around thinking we're this human. And now we're going around thinking, I'm this human that wants to awaken and know my divinity. But I think that it's consciousness evolving and waking up and saying, oh, what, I, I fell asleep and dreamed I was this human. I'm waking up here, and I am going to take this human and drag human to bookstore, find book, oh, Four Agreements looks good. Oh, mirror, mirror for the truth of who I am. And so people are gravitating to teachers, to books, to workshops, because consciousness is sending them. Not the humans trying to wake up, but consciousness trying to wake up inside of the humans to remember its own unity. Because it's the same thing in every being in the universe is animated by that same consciousness, divinity, awareness, love, life, God. It's all the same thing everywhere. In the air between us, it's the same thing, the same intelligence. And I think, this is my new pet theory, that consciousness is waking up, not humans. Consciousness doesn't care about humans. It's waking up, using humans to wake up, dragging us to bookstores, dragging us to workshops, dragging us to YouTube videos about awakening, so it can look in the mirror and remember who it is. That's what I got from Miguel Ruiz. I finally was able to look in the mirror 
and see his divinity as a reflection of my divinity. Is this happening to just some people or all? Can it happen to, when you say consciousness is in all of us, but there's some people that have a gross consciousness. It's a very coarse uh, reality and mm -hmm. a very coarse sense of self. Mm -hmm. So how could this consciousness be realized at that time? And do they need to read this book? And, and, or is there other practical, pragmatic things that they need to do to set the beginnings for this to happen? Or can it just happen spontaneously, as it all, does to some? All of the above. Yes. I think everybody should read my book, of course, the Everything Toltec Wisdom book, which has very complete with tools and much more kind of psychological approach. But that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be more accessible for everybody, your book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it talks on a, on a level that people could understand it on a uh, rudimentary, elementary level that we could all relate to. Give, give us an example of your book and what it's about. Well, it's about the whole thing. Because the three masteries in the Toltec tradition of Miguel Ruiz mm -hmm. are the mastery of awareness, the mastery of transformation, mm -hmm. and the mastery of intent. And so this book is divided into those three parts. So the mastery of awareness is where we pretend the human is waking up and saying, oh, I've been asleep, and it's really consciousness. Um, I've been asleep, and I've been dreaming, we say in Toltec, I've been dreaming which means I've been taking in the light from the outside world and I've been distorting it according to all the stuff that was put in my brain really early on. So a little virtual reality of the world is showing up in my brain, which really isn't what's out there. And the more distorting stuff, the more brutal our childhoods, the more religious programming, the more kind of farther and farther from that reality of oneness and wholeness and love and acceptance our childhood and our early lives were, the more stuff there is to distort the beauty and perfection of the universe coming in and the farther people are from that when they perceive it inside of them because it's been distorted. So that makes it very difficult for somebody to pick up a book like The Four Agreements or my Toltec Everything book and have it make sense because the words come in off the page and they're going through the channels of perception in their minds and there's all that stored junk in there and it gets trapped and it changes it and it makes like to be impeccable with your word. People read that book, first agreement, always be impeccable with your word. And the first thing they think is they translate it into, I should be honest, I should tell the truth, I should have integrity, I should keep my commitments, I shouldn't steal pencils from the office. You know, I should, I should, I should, I should. And that is so far away from what he said in the book. And it's right there in the book. It's carefully explained in the first part of that book. And I talked to so many people that distorted, they took it impeccable and it went in and it took all of their stored light about integrity, they, they shifted over, responsibility, integrity, and they created a dream of it in there that's not what he said in the book and it misses the most elemental, beautiful part of the whole story. Which is what? Well, he says that impeccable comes from the Latin impeccatus. Peccata is sin, and im, peccata, is without sin. So he says that impeccable, it comes from that root, to be without sin. Then he defines sin, which is a little scary, but he defines sin as to not use your word against yourself. That we sin when we use our word against ourselves. We are not impeccable when we use our word against ourselves. And as you said, you could use any agreement, and that's really the basic agreement right there, because if we were actually impeccable with our word, we would never use it against ourselves, we would never judge ourselves, which is a big way we all go against ourselves. If we never accepted ourselves, we'd always be in love with ourselves and be right there, right where I'm talking about, you see. One intention, one agreement, I will never judge myself. And of course we do, the minute we do it, then we judge ourselves for judging ourselves and we're in this loop. But we just come back, we don't judge ourselves for judging ourselves for judging ourselves. We just come back to it and we say, oh, I'm using my word against myself, I stop, cut it off, stop, back where I was, back in this moment, and we go from there. So that's how the, the stored light can distort the incoming. And the more junk there is, 
the more it distorts. So the people with a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of addictions, it's hard for them to, to, to get the magic. And it's not that they can't, it's, it just clogs up things. People who are really sharp and kind of clear can also get tricked because they think, oh, I'm good, my life is working, you know, marriage is all right, and you know, the kids behave most of the time and I'm making good money, so I got no problems, I got nothing to work on. That's a trick on the other side too because they get locked into that identity and then identifying as that external world creates fear that they'll lose it, that something will go wrong. If the wife says, I didn't like what you did or you're late or whatever, oh, my good husband identity is slipping and there's fear behind all that. So you very clearly said it that when we're really impeccable with our word and, and, and break all these old agreements that we learned, what we're doing is we're gaining personal freedom which ultimately is the freedom from fear. And since our default state is love, joy, happiness, celebration, when we release the fear that's been pushed into us and programmed into us, we go back to our default state and as love, and we put the universe back together. And that's what consciousness, I think, is evolving to do, is to come back and recognizing, like many people are doing now, that, oh, I took the world apart into all of these little pieces, good, bad, right, and wrong, sexy, not sexy, beautiful, and ugly, and, and I like that, and I don't like that, and that one's judging me, and I'm not as good as that one, and everything's a mirror of how I need to be better and more and all that. And good consciousness doesn't do that. Trees don't do that. Earthworms don't do that. Humans are the only species in the whole universe that I know of that do that. I like that you say default and compared to a computer. Mm -hmm. that we're on our default page, which our default is of coming from our natural state of being, of, of love. And somehow we programmed it and, and there's a lot of other uh, filters in there that are stopping us from being in that natural state mm -hmm. of our default page. And yeah. our default page is basically a beautiful place to be oh. and so effortless. Oh. and. It's, it's amazing how people don't know of this. They're, they're living a very complicated life, and it's unnecessary, yes. totally. They're bringing a lot of drama to themselves unnecessarily. I'm understanding that if people would rely on a, a, on a state of being purifying, that they would rely on this way of being, of saying, okay, quite simply, should I go to the negative or should I address the positive? And in the positive, you cannot go wrong. It's all mm -hmm. the simple, basic things that brings us to our fullness of who we are and yeah. who we can be. And when we choose this other way of, of that we're not in our purity, our state of natural being, then we're causing more problems for ourselves. And it's, it's as simple as that. It's no more complicated than that. Mm -hmm but people really are not grasping that. You as a relationship expert, what have you seen in the unfoldment of others that oh. have come and trained with you? You must see some beautiful stories. Oh, I do, I do, I do. And something I'd like to touch on before we make that segue mm -hmm. is the trick built into even many spiritual practices, along with psychology and everything, is that we should be more loving, we should be more accepting. And there's a judgment in that, there's a hierarchy in that. And the minute we buy into that hierarchy, we give it to our inner judge, and we're never really doing acceptance and love. It, it's based on the idea that out there somewhere, there's somebody saying, you should be more loving, you should be more aware, like a, just a new god of some kind with new rules. The two commandments, you know, be more loving and be more spiritual or something. And the minute we allow that way of approaching it into our being, we're trapped in the duality of more and less spiritual or more or less loving or more or less divine. Very dangerous. And I really want to, this is something I'm hammering into people all the time and I just want to make sure we share that here mm -hmm. with the people watching is that we can't push it into love. 
You can't make yourself be more loving because being loving, real loving, is accepting, which is a surrender, it's an opening, it's not a, we can't make it happen. So what the Toltecs teach is that once we have awareness of this mechanism of the light coming in and distorting itself in our channels of perception based on our own programming, is the transformation of our lives is to clean that stuff out of those channels. To be the jaguar, which is a symbol of that level of, it goes from the serpent to the jaguar to the eagle. And the jaguar stalks in the jungle of the inner mind and its prey is the programs, its lies, it's the, it's the hierarchies and the false beliefs in there, the old agreements. And it's the jaguar that can find those and shake them and throw them out and say, what's a new thing I could put in this story in the channel here so when that thing happens on the outside and comes in and goes through the channels, it'll pick up this new story, this new agreement, and create happiness and peace, love. As long as we're bypassing that process of cleaning up that stored light, it'll always trip us up. You see how that works? And we're, we're going to be pushing ourselves into some spiritual concept of love and acceptance rather than actually creating it through the shifting and changing of the program. So it's an actual process that's happening in, in real time. Very it's not important. A, it's not an a analytical thinking process of doing something that you have to do something. It's, it's an ongoing, engaging process of awareness. Yeah. So you start with the jaguar, then you move, and the, the last is the ego. Uh -huh. and the eagle. And the eagle yes. is the, represents the mastery of intent. After we've cleaned those channels, then the, the light can come through fairly clear and clean and represent what's really out there. We can never see what's really out there because we always have to bring the information, like the, the organs of perception have to bring the information from the outside world to us. So we can't see out there. We see what the light and sound and taste and touch and everything brings us to here. So these are our organs of perception. Then it travels into what I call the organ of deception, which changes it and gives us a little virtual reality in there and says, that's what's out there. And part of the mastery of awareness is remember realizing, wow, I can't trust this little, I can't really trust what I'm thinking is out there because I've changed it. And the more garbage I've got in there, the more I've changed it. You looking at me, you know, that kind of thing. No, what are, you, who, what are you talking about? Yeah, I saw you looking at me. Let's go outside in the parking lot. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'll take, you know, mm. because it's distorted into that, in that case, kind of anger and taking it personally and stuff, when it didn't even happen, you see. So, once you've cleaned those channels of perception, of which the Toltecs have amazing tools, and I've added a few of, from my own psychological background, but they just amazing things that we can do to use to become aware and then transform those that stored light. Give okay. us an example of what you use to change these tools. Um, one of my favorites is the Angel of Death. This is a Toltec tradition, the Angel of Death. It's in a lot of traditions in different ways. Mm -hmm. In the tradition of the Toltecs, the Angel of Death owns everything, everything. Everything we have is owned by the Angel of Death. And she loans it to us to use, and then she takes it back whenever she wants it back. And we have no control of it. You cannot bargain with the angel of death. You cannot make deals. You cannot beg and plead. She just takes it back when she's ready. So she loans us our youth and our nice clear skin when we're young, and she, our, our relationships and our automobiles, and, she, and every little thing on the shelves in our house and they come and go. One day we say, oh, I want this, and we put it on a bookshelf, and another day it's stolen, or we break it, or it, we decide we don't want it anymore. It goes back to the angel of death. So the magic of the angel of death is that we have a choice to either surrender to the angel of death and have gratitude for what she's loaned us, and live in gratitude for all the gifts, for our clothing and our house and our friends and our lovers and even as our lover is leaving us we see oh the angel of death is taking her back 
taking him back. So I can have grief over that loss, but at the same time I'm holding gratitude for the loan and for the gift rather than, oh my God, this isn't fair, I hate this, it's, you know, and being victims. Because when we're victims, we're in fear. So we have a choice of being in gratitude, which is love for the loan, or fear that we're going to lose the gifts. And so the angel of death who walks right behind us over our left shoulder, putting in things and taking out things, can be a beautiful guide to us in our lives. And the magic is that when we do surrender and we say, okay, I agree, it's all yours. I am grateful for the loans. I'll enjoy what you give me while it's here. A relationship, an automobile, a home, a little thing on the shelf, a, a pet. And I surrender the outcome to you. I live in surrender to the outcome to you. When that happens, we quit being afraid of the future. What's going to happen to this? Oh my God, you know, I'm going to lose. I've got to get it right for this person so they won't leave me. We come back to the present moment. And the present moment of gratitude and love is where life is actually happening. The only place life is actually happening. And when we do that, the angel of death turns into the angel of life. Well, let's Jeez. clarify, yeah. I'm sorry, let's clarify for those who are listening who are saying, okay, it's okay to grieve if, mm. there's, if there's negativity or if there's loss or a depart, departure of a, of, of a beloved. It's okay to grieve, yet there's no judgment on that. It's an experience. You're merely having an experience, and it's right. okay to allow that experience to happen and to witness it and to know that it's an impermanence to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just did that this week and wow, just poof. What did you do this week? Oh, I, this week I had an experience like you're talking about where grief just Would you like to share poured that? poured through me. Sure. Please. Um, my cat died. This is a, not only a companion for 19 years, but a real fixture in the Toltec world. Um, somebody called me and said, oh my God, every time we were meeting at your house, you know, and and having potlucks and groups and meetings for all these long years, Annie, Joy Dancer, the cat, had been part of it. Hmm. She, was, she wasn't one of those cute little fluffy cats that comes around and, and gets on your lap and purrs and you think that's nice. She was crabby, she was bossy. She was, had such personality. She had a lot of wildness in her. She lived outside, you know, she was outside a lot. She wasn't like a pampered little house cat. But boy, she had her rules. It's the reason, she's the reason people say dogs have masters and, and cats have servants, because she had her routines and her schedules and she, you know, she was really bossy. And if you were sitting petting her and talking to somebody and then you quit paying attention and you, you weren't present, she'd turn around and go, ah, you know, <laughs> and say, hey, you either focus on me and actually relate to me or don't do it, don't touch me. She was a Toltec. She was like so present and so on top of her game. And we all just loved her. And she would, if she was hungry and I was on a Skype conference with an apprentice somewhere, and she'd start walking across the keyboard, you know, saying, hey, what about me? She was just so, and people would just love her and, and ask about her. And she was just a fixture in my life and the Toltec world. And she got sick and was going downhill and, and wasn't in pain, so I decided to let her die at home. And she, it took about four or five days where she quit eating and quit drinking and deteriorated and just went down and down and down and was just pretty much comatose a lot of times. But if I came in the room and said hi to her, she'd help me raise her head and then lay back down again. And um, last Monday I was teaching in the evening and, and, and then I went to sleep. She was okay. She was barely there. I mean, barely breathing. And I went to sleep when I woke up, she was gone. And I just went about my routines. I said, okay, I can, I knew this was going to come in, I'm okay. And I went in and I was making my toast and tea for the morning, you know, and just doing my routine. And the, the box of tea, the, the, it wouldn't open right, it just got caught. And I got furious, I tore the lid off the box. And when that anger unleashed, and when the anger of the cap of my feelings was released by my anger, the deep grief just poured out of me, just poured out of me. And I was walking around in the house and in the garden just angry, 
teeming with sobs, the loss, the grief, the, the celebration of her for all these years and the companionship. Oh my God, it was so intense. It was so intense. And I even walked by a mirror and saw my face and wouldn't look at it because I said, if I look at that face, it's going to take this away from me because it was so, like, just, it was beautiful. My face was beautiful, but it was just, I mean, tears streaming and just, oh, God, so real, so amazingly real. So you were feeling your pain and feeling your agony of, of the loss, and in that, you also were mindful that it was a beautiful journey. You were in celebration of that journey. You're in reverence to that journey, mm -hmm. and you saw it as an experience. Without thinking about it. Without thinking about it. In that moment, it. I wasn't thinking those thoughts, but it's become the nature of how I do life, and mm -hmm. so I, that was the experience, yeah. And it lasted maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then I came in, and I went to her. I hadn't, I'd seen that she was gone, but I hadn't done anything yet. So I wrapped her in a towel, and I put her on my couch. I, I wrapped her in a beautiful Peruvian weaving, a manpa, and I laid her on the couch and put a candle there and a flower. And I actually left her there for a couple of days and um, buried her on Wednesday in the backyard. And we, we made a little headstone and drew a little cross and wrote Annie Joy Dancer, Joy Dancer being my website. And, 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 and then a friend of mine wrote and said, I have a suggestion, beautiful shamanic friend. He said, leave her bowl full of water down there on the floor where she usually eat, ate and drank and float a flower in it. And I did that. And it was just so sweet to walk by and see that. And it was a big dahlia. And one day, I, the second day, I mean, this hasn't, it's only a few days here, but it seems like a long time, I saw the flower had been in the water long enough that the center had dropped out of it, and the petals had floated away from that center. You know, you were talking about the heart center and stuff earlier, and here's, here was this heart center of this being, and my relationship with her had dropped out into the water, which metaphysically is often the ocean, you know, the, this water is emotions, and it had dropped out, and the petals are floating out away from that, just like her spirit was floating back into the oneness, you know. And I said, that that's done. And I didn't, I haven't gone back to that place of grief. I have felt her, I've been, I can't even say I've been sad. The actual releasing of that grieving, not the, oh, poor me, now I'm alone, I shouldn't have, I should have taken better care of her, I should have bought her great food. 19 years she lived. Um, that's suffering, that's why me, this poor me, this I'm a victim, that's suffering, that's not grieving. Grieving is, you know, grieving takes us from I had a cat to I don't have a cat. Well, when you do this sound of pow, it, am I interpreting that that is the fullness of you feeling what you were experiencing? Yes. And in that feeling of what you're experiencing, you're giving celebration to mm -hmm. witnessing yes. what is actually happening. Yes. Where there's something amiss that people lose this. They, they could go into the story for a long, mm -hmm. long, long time and years will pass and they're still in the loss of the story. As you said, I should have taken better care of my cat. I should have done this. I should have bought more food. I should have been better. That is the story. So when yeah. you lose yourself in the story, that henceforth is the judgment of what's yes. going on. So it's basically... If people really can understand what we're talking about on the finest fundamental level, they would see that, my God, what a beautiful, beautiful journey this life is. Yes. And oh. how we make oh. it so, so complicated yeah. unnecessarily. Yes. Absolutely. And it's so simple to change from a life of fear to a life of love and gratitude. It's that simple. In one moment, you could do that, except for all the garbage that's, right. that's working against us, all the beliefs. Like, like the belief that we shouldn't cry, we should tough it up, we should you know, be strong. If that agreement is strong enough, 
and your cat dies or your husband leaves or you have you know somebody dies in a crash or whatever if that agreement is strong enough you will not experience your grief you may go into the suffering of stories and why me and I you know I should have done differently but you won't release it through grief mm. and so by cleaning those agreements and saying wait a minute to, to jaguar says wait a minute who said we shouldn't cry you know who said we shouldn't cry well, our parents did. They sent us to our room. They said they were going to make us cry more. You know, they give us something to cry about. Is it all true? And then we have to really look at that and say, wait a minute, that's not true. I should, I, I have sadness. It wells up. Isn't spirit wanting me to experience it and having it come all the way out and discharge it and get it over with? And that was the blessed gift that I had, was I didn't have a lot of that interference. You know, it started, it lasted for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But this little bit of anger which I wouldn't have had if it hadn't been for this other stuff wanting to come out. I don't normally get up and rip tea boxes in anger because they don't open easily. But that anger was, was like the cap on everything else. When I released it, when I just felt that, a little bit, of, a little irritation, pow, then it could all come out. Mm. And, when, and I have my conscious relationship circle every week here, and so my teaching on Wednesday night was about the anger, the cap, and how we can use that anger to release all the other stuff. Because if they got angry at us for crying, we had to repress the crying, but we got angry at them for being angry at us. So we had to push our own anger down. So our own, And then we got angry at ourselves for pushing our anger down. And so the anger seems to be like the cap, like on a volcano, you know, and it starts rumbling. And then we go, I shouldn't cry, I shouldn't have emotions. We push it down even farther more anger. But if we can find ways to release that anger physically, you know, with a plastic baseball bat, whatever it takes, pow, all this other stuff just pours out. And welcome all of this. And welcome it all and say, this yes. is life. This is life moving in me. Yes. So it was an amazing experience to, to see myself thinking I was holding it back or could or should or whatever. But it's so close, so close to the surface that one little thing, it came out. And... I thought I would do a week of the bowl and some, a candle. You know, I had a Virgin of Guadalupe candle burning in my living room for her. And I emptied the bowl. And then this morning before I left the house, I looked at the candle and I said, I'm done. And I just blew out the candle and said, thank you, angel of life, for this gift of this companion, this character, this this nuisance, this love in my life for all these years. And, and I'm, the way I'm going to receive that gift is to embody that in me and remember that I can be crabby, loving, demonstrative, take care of myself, get my needs met. I can take her spirit and like make it mine and not deny any of the kind of truth that I experience and feel in my life. Because she didn't. She didn't hold back. She didn't have rules. She didn't have agreements. Oh, mm -hmm. I shouldn't. I shouldn't come in and ask for dinner until he's finished with his apprentice on the on Skype, you know. She didn't do that. That's a human thing. So beautiful. Let's talk about the fundamentals of what is blocking people that they're in their dream and they're lost in their dream. People become hypnotized, mesmerized. They are lost in uh, practice manners. Yes. They are completely institutionalized inside of themselves in this way of being. Yeah. And th th there's no way that life can enter there. They think they are living, but they're actually just going through the motions of living. And there's, it, what comes with that is there's a feeling of numbness, an incredible numbness that is, it is absolutely paralyzes them. And then this way becomes their, they get used to this way of being. Yeah. And they start to think that this is their life. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievably sad, but it, it's the reality. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot of people in the information age that we're in right now, as everything is quickening up and, and people have, have moments to process things. And there's an incredible numbness that's going on. So let's talk about that and explore yeah. that. Yeah. What possibilities there is for those who are listening to us and are saying, you know, I'm hearing a lot there, but I just don't know how to implement it. 
I don't even know where to begin. Mm -hmm. So let's start at the very, very beginning of what they could do and yeah. offer them some jewels there. Beautiful. Of wisdom. Yes. And I love the way the, the Toltec path is arranged in masteries. Mm -hmm. Because that a mastery of awareness, which is what we're kind of creating more, mostly here, mm -hmm. is the mastery of awareness that says, oh, this is not really life. I'm living through a program that other people programmed into my mind, and I'm using that program to distort the incoming sensory data, mm -hmm. and I'm distorting it, and I can't really see what's out there. I don't really know anything about what's out there. That is the wake-up call. We call it dreaming, and the mastery of dreaming, and the mastery of dreaming is to be constantly aware of the fact that we're not seeing what's out there. It spooks a lot of people. They go, well, then how do I know it's real? How do I know what's going on? I say, you don't. And because of the distortions, like you said, we spend a lot of our energy as humans putting up false fronts and, and strategies and masks and playing roles to protect ourselves from people finding out all the things that we were told were wrong with us and when we didn't behave properly and we chewed with our mouth open and we didn't and we relate and we shouldn't and we said that and we talked back and we used anger and we cried and most of it was emotional stuff. Most of what we got judged for and punished for was our emotions, our anger. It's not fair. You're mean. I hate you, Mom. I think a lot of us would know what happens when we say that. Rarely do I talk to anybody that says, oh, when I said that, my mom took me in the bedroom and said, where's your mom pillow? And we found my mommy pillow in a plastic bat, and I, I beat up mommy, and she was right there saying, yeah, you tell your mommy what she did wrong. You tell her why you're mad. And mom's listening, and when it's all over and he's exhausted, she says, oh, sweetheart, I think mommy could fix some of that. Now, here's what we can't fix, but this is what we can fix, so let's talk about this. I, never, I haven't heard that story very much. So that's what clogs us up is the old program. And all the rules about how to be good and get it right. And the family started it. And very often the parents are, have different standards and different dreams. Dad's real strict and mom's real loose. Or, you know, Dad says you can't go to the play with your friends. And mom says, it's yeah. okay, go ahead. You know? It's okay. Well, well, how do I know what to do? How do I know how to get it right? Or how do I know to earn the approval from the outside? So the core issue here is, and you mentioned my conscious relationship work, which is my five agreements for the new relationship. I'll have to come back for that probably. But the first one, the first agreement in my conscious relationships, the new agreement, well, the old agreement is when we're told that we have to be good and perform and get it right, get good grades, be quiet, hide, be funny, whatever it is, in order to get love, in order to get approval, safety, acceptance in our families and then later with peers in school and God and you know all the way up to line Santa Claus all of them what we have to do is this whole list of standards we have to meet and they're judged we're judged according to those standards and when we come into this world we don't know about that when we come into this world we are love incarnate we are that acceptance we are that divinity we have no knowledge no rules no expectations no time, no names for anything. We can lay out there on the table and be naked and the neighbors come over and they're changing us and they say, oh, isn't he cute, you know, she's so darling. Pretty soon they're saying, hey, don't go out of their house naked. You can't run around naked outside. That's bad. It's wrong. Get in here, swat, you know. What's the matter with you? Well, I came in here naked and it wasn't wrong for the first six months and now it's, okay, okay, I'll catch up, I'll catch up. So they teach us that that love and approval exists outside of us. And in order to get it, we have to be good and get it right and perform. We came in as it, but they couldn't control us. They couldn't domesticate us. They couldn't make us behave unless we were afraid. But we weren't afraid of anything when we came in. So how do we allow the crack of light to come in there? I would think through, first of all, curiosity. One would start with that and say, well, how do I undo this numbing effect that I have here? Mm -hmm. How do I undo this mesmerizing, hypnotized, uh, robotic way that I have of being in this world? Yeah. Be curious that something mm -hmm. else could be happening here. 
and that can be offering a, a, a mere crack of light that can yeah. come into their life yeah. and from there what is possible next. Yeah, and I like to hold out the carrot that says what's possible is you can go back to that default state of love and happiness and joy mm -hmm. and freedom from judgment in full acceptance of yourself in the world. And all it, all it needs is changing the program that they put in there. So, mm -hmm. so the tools, you know, the, that first opening is the awareness that this isn't it. The awareness that we're robots acting out of a program. If people come home at night after work, say, and they collapse and they say, oh my God, I just am exhausted. And they just turn on the TV, they eat microwave dinner and they turn on the TV because they have no energy for anything creative or joyful. Wake up, because the human has a tremendous amount of energy and a tremendous amount of vitality every day. So when you say wake up? Wake up to the fact that you are using your vital human energy to put up masks, to hold on to facades, to try to get right for the boss and then the kids and then your partner and, and the grocery clerk and, and you're just you're character acting all day right. and exhausting yourself. But in that wake up, there's wake no up. there's no judgment to it. No. So let let's let's define that and really yeah. emphasize what that wake up is. Yes. There's no judging that you have to do something that you're bad for not doing it. There's no. It's just allowing yourself to bring attention into it, a softness as as you will. Yeah. And in that softness, bringing that curiosity, and there things will begin to shift naturally in their own state of, mm -hmm. of curiosity and openness. Yes. And the more awareness people can generate of the, telling themselves the truth, that I'm, I'm afraid. I go into the world and I'm afraid. Mm. I have anxiety. I was at a drugstore waiting for somebody to fill a prescription the other day and I was looking at the shelves and all the shelves I was standing looking at were filled with all these different medications for heartburn. Well, heartburn is like, to me, it's like anxiety riding up and causing indigestion and everything because things can't move, things can't, it's not peaceful, it's not flowing, the stomach is like, ah! And that's because of the fear that everybody lives in. Everybody's going around saying, I'm not afraid, I'm fine, yeah, but move back a little bit, would you? And I'm wearing my shades and I'm wearing a mask and, and if you get too close and you spend too much time looking at me, you're going to see through the hole in the mask and you're going to see all the things I'm afraid of that the judge says about me that are bad and wrong. Right, that I've been hiding from everybody and you're not supposed to be glimpsing at exactly. that. Exactly. Right. So I have to move you back. I have to distract you. I have to pontificate or I have to be a victim or I have to be a joker. Or Everybody's got a whole list of priority strategies for pushing people away, managing that intimacy that keeps people from seeing what their inner judge mm -hmm. says. So the very first wake up is you're afraid. If you're afraid, own it, acknowledge it. Then you can say, what am I afraid of? And you'll find out that you're afraid because of the stories that they're getting picked up in there and it doesn't have anything to do with out there. Then you say, okay, if the stories are making me afraid, making me angry, making me feel hurt, I could change the stories. They weren't there when I started. Somebody else programmed them in there. Wait a minute, I could change the stories. And that's the mastery of transformation, you see. We wake up, and then we change, and then we're free in the mastery of intent to be the eagle, just looking down from the eagle's perspective and seeing the beauty and perfection of everything with no separation, no judgment, no good, bad, right, and wrong. And that's freedom. For a person who sees themselves as a loving, compassionate, sensitive, romantic person, and they're seeing the world around them that people are insensitive and they're not seeing who they are. They want to be seen. They want to be known of who they are. Mm -hmm. And people say to these people, well, maybe you should toughen up. You mm -hmm. know, maybe you should get a thicker skin. You shouldn't be the way you are. Mm -hmm. So where is the truth in that? I mean, you can't change the world. You can't change yourself. But I would think in saying toughen up is not the answer. I would say to stay who you are and to express yourself and from that way of being and know that you can set your boundaries, know that you, you have express your needs. And on those levels, when you are heard and seen on that level, there's no conflict of inner conflict that 
can take place. Mm -hmm. But people are lost. They get, they start to project outside of themselves and seeing the problem that's outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. It's the others. Right. So yeah. let's let's talk about that and see where yeah. we could go with that and yeah. what you sense would actually what advice you would give to others who are having this experience. Thank you. Yeah, great stuff. This is fun. A um, couple of directions of that. My experience is that as people become more loving and accepting of themselves, they become more loving and accepting of the world as it is. And they don't have that conflict. So if somebody's describing that conflict, oh, I'm peaceful, I'm spiritual, but everybody else is irritating, I'm going to say, you haven't by any chance created a spiritual bypass as one of the strategies to avoid being seen and known. The spiritual bypass these days is one of the trickiest strategies. If somebody's drinking all day, we can say, oh boy, you know, they got a strategy that's killing them. But if somebody says, I'm rising above my pain, I'm rising above my deficiencies, I'm rising above my fear, and I'm going to float about the world and love everybody and, and anoint everybody with my magic wand and remind them to wake up and love God, that can be very beautiful. But if it's a strategy to avoid feelings and hurt and pain, I call it the spiritual bypass. They're a judge, but instead of the black robes behind the bench, they've put on a white robe and they're floating three feet off the ground in a full lotus, but they're still judging hmm. themselves and each other and others. So the real question is, if I am actually in that spiritual loving place with myself, why can't I see the rest of the world that way? Because the rest of the world is just as beautiful as you are just as beautiful. It's all perfect. If, it's all, if I'm divine, it's divine. I don't get to be divine if it's not divine. I don't get to be perfect if it's not perfect. So, if I can't see the perfection there, I'm kidding myself if I'm seeing the perfection here. Exactly. Yeah. Alan, it's been an absolute delight to speak with mm. you. Absolutely. That's Thank fine. you. And it's a great honor, great pleasure. Thank you. Great treat. And I'd like to, we just have a final moment if you would just share what would be close to your heart and dear to you that you would like to share with others. Mm, thank you. Mm. You say I have, what, a couple of hours? or uh, I, You're welcome to come back, and I'd love <laughs> to speak to you in the future as okay. you will come back. Okay. But at this moment, we just yeah. have a, a brief moment here. The bottom line for joydancer.com, which is my website, my world, my life, or dancing in joy with life, yes. joydancer.com, little commercial, um, is live passionately without attachment to the outcome. If you can do that, you're free. And we're attached to the outcome when we have fear. And when you're attached to the outcome, you can't live passionately because you are worried, you're afraid. You can't, you can't just engage in the moment. So you go to the fear, not judging, but say, how can I clean up the fear that's created by the stories? If I can clean up the fear, I can come back to this moment and live with great passion in every moment. And that's the Joy Dancer goal, the Toltec Joy Dancer path, is to live passionately without attachment to the outcome. Everybody can do it. If I can do it, everybody can do it. And if they want help, I'm standing by. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alan. Oh, thank, thank you for you having so much. me here. So sweet, Victoria. And from the Art of Conscious Living, thank you. And take care of yourself and take care of others. Thank you.